Good afternoon. Thank you for standing by. This is Michelle Giroux of the Rural Wireless Association. The RWA Education Committee is pleased to welcome you to this RWA GSMA webinar on mobile device crime. I have a few quick items to cover before our presenter gets started. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please type your question into the chat feature located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. If you need to reach an operator at any time, you may press star zero. And finally, this conference is being recorded April 18, 2017, and will be available on the RWA website and will be sent to RWA members as well. I'd now like to turn the conference over to Jason Smith of GSMA. Jason? Hi there, good afternoon. Thank you, Michelle. Um, this is Jason Smith. I'm with the GSMA. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this afternoon. Some of you might still be before lunch. Uh, I am the Senior Director of Device Check with GSMA, and that uh, pertains to one of our products and services uh, that we support. But uh, I started with the company about 10 months ago. Uh, one of the initiatives that uh, I was tasked with is trying to bring additional focus and attention, attention to the North American market. And as we discussed a little bit uh, later um, during the presentation, uh, that will become evident, and there are some initiatives that in particular uh, we're about to launch in the U.S. Uh, two of the goals that we have today are, number one, first and foremost, to educate you about mobile device theft and prevention measures. Uh, the second goal uh, is to obtain your buy-in as small carriers in the U.S. to join our effort to block and report devices that are not with their rightful owner and try to explore new uh, opportunities and initiatives that can further benefit not only wireless carriers, consumers, law enforcement, but really the entire mobile ecosystem. So some of the topics that we're going to be discussing today uh, that we mentioned you may have seen in the webinar, uh, cellular network blocking by device ID. We'll talk about that and, and how it's done and, and how it really evolved, utilizing the, the global GSMA blacklist. And I'll, I'll point out the distinction in that term, GSMA blacklist. Uh, we'll talk about some implementation of FCC initiatives to defer device theft. Uh, we'll talk about uh, some transparency and trying to address devices that are um, bought, sold, subject to some type of a lease or installment purchase agreement. We have some ideas and some interest in, in moving forward with some services that can help uh, protect those devices, as well as devices that might be in transit, you know, just in, uh, from the time they leave a, uh, a manufacturer until their, their point of destination. And lastly, but certainly not least, uh, we want to facilitate participation by the smaller U.S. carriers. Um, in the past, there, there may not have been uh, as much attention to that, and that's something that I hope that I can help uh, overcome to obtain your participation. Uh, just some statistics to start off in trying to understand what has been going on with blacklisting and lost and stolen devices. It's really important to look at globally the number of devices that are lost and stolen. So if on the left axis, you actually have a monthly figure of that globally uh, more than 10 million devices met are reported lost and stolen um, per month. And so this is a, a 24 month, excuse me, 1 million, over 1.6 1, 1 million devices that are reported lost and stolen per month. And globally, over the past two years, that ends up being around 30 million devices uh, in total. So how does that compare to the U.S.? On the left axis, again, we have a monthly figure that in the U.S. alone, you're looking at about 250,000 devices net that are reported lost or stolen. And global, excuse me, in the U.S., uh, over the past two years, that number is well over 7 million. So the problem still exists. The trends um, have remained fairly constant. Uh, the spikes that you see are really related to uh, some bulk uploads, maybe 
maybe a carrier that joined in that had a large list of their own all of a sudden um, populated the, the, the list and therefore the GSMA blacklist and therefore the number peaked at that time. But as you can see, quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of devices that are that are still being reported lost or stolen. Um, the U.S. figures. So where does that data come from? Um, today, contributing to the GSMA blacklist, uh, we have AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, Sprint, and U.S. Cellular that are actively reporting lost and stolen devices on a daily and in some cases an hourly basis. Uh, we have a sixth carrier, uh, Nucor Wireless, um, that I believe is a participant in RWA. They are connected and approved, uh, but at this time are, are not yet contributing data. So it provides us an opportunity uh, to move forward and to grow this list in the U.S. Uh, there are some technical solutions and things that we need to work with to make it simpler. And we have identified those and, and have a, a plan, if you will, in place that we hope to join with you in getting more carriers connected. So before we move too much further, I've got a quick survey for you. And the poll will be open. And so I'm trying to understand, you know, do you have the ability to block devices by the device ID, the IMEI or the MEID? So this is GS, GSMA or LTE or CDMA data. So do you have the ability to block devices by this device ID today? If you could kindly just mark yes, no, or, or not sure, and we'll, we'll collect responses. So this would be on your own internal network. This is, this is not uh, contributing or participating with a GSMA blacklist. This would just be today, even if it were a manual process where somebody called in and they reported their device ID, you know, could you go in and block it? And it's important to answer the question from the perspective of it being the device ID as, as opposed to perhaps the, the account or the number. So right now we have a good response rate. I'll leave it open for about 10 more seconds. Thank you very much. And I will go ahead and, and close the, the poll. So we, we have a handful, uh, about five that are yes that they can block, uh, 12 with no, and, and 12 that are not sure. So that would be something to to try to figure out. You know, what what is the you know, if you were going to go back and as, a, as an action after this call to try to figure out, okay, can we do this? If so, how and, and what is the effort? Uh, so we'll talk about next some initiatives and some things that, that will answer, you know, why should I even do this? Um, um, first of all, the FCC Technical Advisory Committee uh, did come up with a set of recommendations a couple of years ago. Uh, we are helping to implement some of those recommendations. One of those was to actually uh, have carriers connect to the GSMA database. So the GSMA database itself um, has lost stolen devices from all over the world. And uh, as I'll point to uh, in, the, in the chart that should be displayed now, GSMA really sits at the center of this device ecosystem, and it all starts with the fact that GSMA issues the type allocation codes for all mobile devices to all mobile device manufacturers. So they get the, the TAC codes. Those TAC codes and the device attributes are stored uh, by GSMA, and GSMA provides services um, that are called device database and device map where uh, users of the service can access all types of different data device attributes uh, for mobile devices. The GSMA blacklist, I can point to it, the GSMA blacklist is an exchange of operators or by operators of their own respective blacklist. So you may even have a blacklist today for your own network. If you looked up and said, yes, we've got this number of device IDs. We have blocked them on our network. They're on your own internal blacklist. So all these other carriers around the world, over 100 of them, um, actually connect and exchange their blacklist information with other carriers. So you know, theoretically, 
you know, within a 24-hour period of time, sometimes less, some other operator in another country um, can report or, or a user calls in to report that device lost or stolen, they're able to have their carrier blacklist the device and they populate the global database which other carriers then exchange and take that data and can block on their own networks. The ecosystem that we have, now we have device identities and then we have blacklist data. So we've combined that information and provided a service to the rest of the wireless ecosystem. So law enforcement, traders, recyclers, insurance, that service where the users are able to actually look up a device, verify its status or presence on the, black, the global GSMA blacklist is GSMA device check. So the GSMA device check service uh, supports more than 3 million queries per year, or excuse me, per month, and is reaching close to 100 million lifetime queries. And about half of those originate within the U.S. So the important aspect of the device check service is not only were we able to provide the status whether the device is on the blacklist or not, lost, stolen, uh, we're also able to provide some of those key attributes. So if you're a recycler, trader, consumer, trying to check the status of a device, uh, one, you may get a lost, stolen, kind of good-bad indicator on the device. Um, but let's say you even have a, a good status. It's not lost or stolen. But that if the device description that you have doesn't match up with what's being reported from the device database attributes, you should be suspicious that perhaps that device has been altered, tampered with, and could still be a bad device. So this information is used regularly um, by a number of entities you know, mostly in the commercial space, but we do have an increasing amount of law enforcement participation. And that service is, the device check service is provided uh, for free to uh, law enforcement and on a four fee basis to commercial. But, but jumping over to the GSMA blacklist service, trying to just make sure there's a clear understanding of the GSMA blacklist uh, that is really, again, an exchange of operators' own blacklist. Uh, as I mentioned before, there are more than 100 operators, and that's spread across 35 countries. Uh, we still have some work to do to expand to other parts of the world, uh, but we are undertaking some initiatives to help to grow that adoption in other countries where they may be doing some type of blocking and reporting on a national level, but trying to make sure that information is exchanged with the GSMA blacklist. Most of these operators, okay, utilize an equipment identity register. So in the survey question I tried to ask is, you know, do you block today? You know, are you capable of blocking? That's the first step, even if it were on a somewhat of a manual basis. But these operators utilize an equipment identity register, which is a very specific, well-defined in terms of what its functionality is. Our understanding from engaging some of the smaller carriers is that they may not have an equipment identity register but that is not an absolute requirement. In fact, we, we've already identified use cases and have approved where there are processes. If you don't have that, that's okay. We can work out a solution um, that, that is clean, allows you to report devices to the GSMA blacklist, able to uh, download certain data and be able to block on your network. So there are ways around that. Uh, currently, the methods that we use for the GSMA blacklist service is with a secure file exchange. Uh, it's done daily, and we are transitioning many carriers to hourly to try to improve um, that, that system and its performance in fighting device crime. The GSMA device check service that I mentioned before um, has both web and API access methods. So today, you could go to uh, devicecheck.ca, um, ca and you'll find in Canada where they're able to utilize our device check service. So we're, we also have our own uh, branded GSMA device check service that you can find at devicecheck.gsma.com and that would 
provide access for law enforcement and business users. And those are just web examples of how you can access the device check, GSMA device check service. But most of our commercial users, nearly all of them, use an API. We have several APIs that support uh, a variety of different commercial applications, but they also support law enforcement applications to help uh, crime detection. We have e recently uh, even uh, established a relationship with the World Customs Organization so that they can utilize the GSMA device check service with an API, build it into their own system. So really trying to make sure this information gets out to as many users in the ecosystem as possible uh, to help fight device crime. Moving on from the GSMA device check, we have recently launched, or about to launch, uh, a collaborative effort with the CTIA uh, with a new service. It's really a portal uh, that is powered by the GSMA device check service uh, to provide lookups, device lookups to consumer, commercial, and law enforcement users. So this USA only initiative was responsive to an SEC TAC recommendation that said we think a portal would be good um, to allow you know, even consumers the ability to look up device status. So this portal, again powered by GSMA Device Check, will be located at stolenphonechecker.org. It's a collaborative uh, arrangement with the CTIA and will launch publicly uh, in early May. So we're actually completing some user acceptance testing right now. Uh, we'll have an operational launch shortly, but publicly uh, that will launch sometime in the early part of May. And we would, uh, you know, so how does that affect you? It, one, it's important to know that uh, the consumer, the public, law enforcement are going to have increased visibility of the use of this portal, not just the portal, but also just device checking, you know, understanding the value of checking an IMEI or an MEID, a device identifier against the GSMA blacklist, checking its lost stolen status, uh, the public outreach, the outreach efforts that will, um, that will be launched over the coming months, if you will, uh, probably be a little bit of a phased approach, but from a consumer's perspective, consumers are going to know about this and it's going to hopefully be something that's important to them that we can educate them. And so I think it will be something that will be of interest to, to you and your, cons your subscribers as well. So a quick survey um, just to break it up a little bit, asking the, you know, the question is, uh, the survey is, is open and really trying to just ask the question, are you aware of this collaborative effort between GSMA and CTA? Uh, you may not know it as the stolen phone checker. Uh, you may have heard of it as MDIP. That was an acronym that was used, of course, a great technical acronym. Uh, that, was, that stands for Mobile Device Information Portal. And it was a, one of the recommendations uh, from the FCC Technical Advisory Committee to fight device crime. Uh, looks like we're already up to uh, quite a few responses. I'll hold it open for another, another 10 seconds. Really appreciate your feedback right here. It, actually, the overwhelming responses thus far is that no. So that's good and bad. It's bad in that uh, we've got some communication work to do in our industry. Uh, it's good in that uh, that you're here today and and finding out about it. So I will go ahead and and close the close the poll. And as you can you can see. We've got a, a, good, a good bit of work cut out for us to make sure that there's an awareness uh, with, that, uh, with that portal. Again, the portal is stolenphonechecker.org, and that will be uh, – it's completely powered by GSMA Device Check, but it does provide a lot of other useful information even at a consumer level in terms of you know, how do you find your device ID? How, do you, how can you protect your, um, your personal information on, on your mobile device? Uh, we also feel like this effort is going to really help um, from an awareness standpoint of law enforcement. Some of those initiatives were, are really even designed to make sure that at a local level, uh, which we'll be working through the National Sheriff's Association, International Association of Police Chiefs, to make sure that at a local level uh, that those 
agencies are aware of device blocking and, and how to use it not only in prevention of crime, but also in, as an investigative tool uh, where we work with other federal government agencies already. So moving on to, to some of the new stuff, uh, some of the new initiatives, if you will, uh, we have a few initiatives that are somewhat related, but um, some of them are technical, some of them are uh, related to more of your business. Uh, first, the non-blocking data, as, we're, as we call it. Uh, this data we're talking about obtaining and exchanging is distilled device data, but that would not result in network blocking. So some of the examples, uh, the term that we're using very specifically, and there's a reason why, financial encumbrance, which would cover any device that you as a carrier are providing to consumers that might be under a lease, might be under an installment purchase, but you might would like to have that information show up in the device lookups, although it would not be related to uh, specifically blocking and it would not be displayed as blocking, um, it, would certainly, it would certainly be available in those 3 million monthly queries of recyclers, traders, anyone interested in buying a device. Uh, again, half, more than half of those are originate in the U.S. So all of these queries, if we could still put that type of information in there that maybe it's just a flag, you know, a cautionary flag that, that lets someone who's interested in buying that device know that that device is subject to some type of financial contract, may or may not want to disclose the details, whether it's a lease or what, you know, what type of an agreement is, but just that it, there's a flag, just that there is something tied to that device that might need further investigation. If you were one that was going to be selling your device, I know there have been more initiatives to try to make sure consumers are aware if, they're, uh, if they have a, an installment purchase agreement with their device that perhaps they're not even aware that they are buying the device over time. Uh, so I've seen uh, increased uh, awareness campaign to make sure that people know that, oh, you've got you know, 10 more payments left, 9 more payments left. This would just be another tool like that that maybe even let them, if they went to check their own device before selling it or listed it with some type of a online trading exchange, that they would become aware that they actually had some number of payments remaining on the device. So that is one, that is probably the key driver right now is the financial encumbrance for, um, for carriers to be able to uh, alert potential buyers and sellers uh, to the status of a device. Another example of non-blocking data are devices in transit. We have received feedback from manufacturers or those that are heavily involved in the, in the logistics and moving new and used devices, but in particular in this case new devices, uh, of being able to raise a flag, if you will, on a device to when that device leaves the manufacturing facility that they can um, raise a flag on that device, that if it happened to be stolen or misappropriated somewhere in transition, uh, that it would, again, be further alerting the, um, the potential market for devices that uh, may not be with the rightful owner, that they would have an opportunity to be able to flag that device. So that would require a little more uh, expeditious treatment, you know, whereas today, most of the carriers that we exchange data for lost stolen do that on a, on a daily basis. Well, for something like this, we would definitely want to make use of an API and, and have a more real-time updating status of that device. Another initiative that we're working on is third-party blacklisting. What that means is uh, rather than just wireless carriers being able to participate and to send uh, and download information, which carriers are. In this case, third parties such as manufacturers, maybe insurers, you know, if they know that a device is lost or stolen, uh, there are in some cases also government, pseudo-government agencies in other countries that fall into this category, but they are wanting to be able to directly write or submit that device data to the GSMA blacklist. Uh, so we are 
um, developing the use case, the business case, you know, trying to uh, ascertain and summarize the total uh, level of interest in that initiative. And so far, it, uh, we've, been able, we've received um, positive feedback. There are definitely things that we have to, to work out in terms of verification and vetting of those trusted third parties. Uh, but that is, that is something that has uh, uh, obtained increased interest uh, over the last several months in particular. Another service that we are working on, and, and part of it is, is available very soon, is CloudBlock. And this is actually for wireless carriers. This could be applicable to, to you in your situation. Uh, so today, you know, understand that, that many of the smaller carriers are not aware of some of these tools and some of the, um, you know, what the need is, what the tools are, and how you go about doing that. Uh, we have two capabilities that we would like to bring about in a cloud environment using APIs that do not require as much work, if you will, on the back end for smaller carriers. First and foremost is a blocking check just to allow um, a carrier to be able to uh, check the status of a device. Uh, my understanding is that a lot of smaller carriers may use uh, alternative channels and third parties for sourcing mobile devices. This would be a great way uh, if you were actually sourcing those devices to make sure that they are a clean status and not lost, stolen. Uh, secondly, it could, if you have consumers that are trading in devices, you know, this could be a tool uh, they, or bring your own device, making sure that they're bringing on a legitimate device onto your network. So the blocking check is something that we could do quite quickly uh, with an API and could potentially set up a, a web interface and would like to further investigate those solutions uh, with you. The other piece to that is actually reporting. So trying to simplify using a cloud infrastructure, using easy solutions to implement, so that you can today or very soon report to the GSMA blacklist your lost and stolen devices. So in most cases, uh, if there's some type of blocking or list that you're already creating, you know, we've got to find a way and we'd like to work with you so that we can get you connected to that GSMA blacklist. And if that means developing a new interface, making it simple, whether it's web, whether it's API, you know, we'd like to work with you to help, to help do that and to implement those initiatives. So the next survey question uh, poll that is now open, um, just trying to gauge your interest uh, in, in these type of things and understand as an example, you know, the device is subject to a carrier contract. You know, if, I'm assuming that most of you have, um, you know, that provide devices whether you lease them, that might be a smaller, much smaller percentage, but that you're actually selling them on an installment purchase agreement of some type might even be having a purchase money security interest, which is a specific term to that device. Um, but nonetheless, we'd like to try to understand, you know, do you have a demand or a need or interest in protecting these devices that you're actually providing to users uh, subject to some type of a contract and to discourage? Again, this is not meant to be heavy-handed with consumers in any way, shape, form, or fashion. This is really just to help create transparency and awareness. Uh, like the example we talked about where you, you might not have even known that you were paying for that device over time. So if you could just um, complete the survey, interested in protecting devices subject to a carrier contract, it might be yes, might be no, or not sure. And we'll give it another, another five seconds. Uh, we've got a good response so far. And greatly appreciate um, Greatly appreciate that, a good response. And uh, we want to help you, you know, try to under, better understand if the answer is yes, uh, which it looks like about half are yes and half are not sure. And I think that speaks to the application itself and that if it's, if it's a no, uh, you, you probably have some you know, strong opinion. If it's not sure, uh, it's probably more of can we do this? What are, the, what are the obstacles, not just technically, are there regulatory considerations or are there how is it going to be perceived? And so we've been gathering feedback to help make sure that this device, um, subject to device or financial encumbrance terminology and how it's presented in the device check results, both at a consumer level and a commercial level, 
um, is is done so in a way that's good for the whole ecosystem. So thank you very much. I will close the poll. So USA small carrier participation, um, you know, brings up the question of why are we doing what we're doing today? Um, you know, we've we've got the a lot of the larger carriers that are that are already participating, uh, but but if we we have to move forward to um, obtain a, a additional participation, not just in the USA, not just with small carriers in the USA, but but globally. And so we are undertaking a, a very diligent, uh, focused effort to try to help bring in participation with, with all different stakeholders in the wireless ecosystem, but first and foremost those carriers that we feel like that can can join in. We've got to make sure that it's easier to join. We've got to make sure it's easier to start exchanging and blocking. And the the, the benefit of that will be that we have increased uh, blocking of lost stolen devices. Uh, the value of lost stolen devices will continue to diminish uh, the more that these tools are used. So uh, to understand you know, the current uh, treatment of lost stolen devices, uh, that are reported by customers, that's important. We want to make sure that we allow you to uh, help check upon activation of new devices. Uh, so these are tools that can help you as a carrier make sure that your customers are bringing legitimate devices and that, that legitimate devices are operating on your network. Uh, it's important to try to bring you in so that these devices are, are blocked by device ID. You may or may not have the ability to do that as automated as uh, you might like to, but we have some procedures that others have already gone through where they're doing it even in with a, a, a very simple process that I think that we can help you uh, to where you can block devices based upon a, a device ID. You know, you're going to have to be able, in order to participate with the blacklist exchange, the GSMA blacklist, you have to at least make the commitment to blocking lost stolen devices. So it's our job to help make sure that that's um, not onerous and that we can uh, provide you the tools and the resources you need to do that. So if that means, like I mentioned before, developing a web interface, APIs, things that help um, like put, pushing things to the cloud so that you don't have to main some type of a database, those are the things that we're wanting to do in order to encourage small carrier participation. Um, before we open it up to questions, I want to make sure you have our contact information. Uh, my contact information, again, is, is presented here, Jason Smith. But my colleague in London, Marilyn Malpas, uh, has a wealth of experience in this space, both with device check but also with device database and device map and some of the other services uh, that uh, you may find helpful. So I'd like to open it up if you have any questions that you might be able to uh, submit online, this would be a great time to do that. Um, Michelle, maybe if you have some instructions, I'm not sure on, on how to uh, uh, encourage them to or facilitate questions. Yeah, if you have a question, Carrie Bennett has one now, you can type it into the chat box. Um, we'll see it there and Jason can address it. Okay. Uh, Carrie, great question. Uh, do you have to be a GSMA member to participate? Um, no, you do not have to be a GSMA member to participate. Uh, we are working on both tools and policies to, to make this process easier. Um, and so you know, we, we would not want to exclude carriers from participating and reporting lost stolen devices, improving the ecosystem, uh, not want to restrict that just because they're not a GSMA member. Great question. Okay, any other questions? Thanks, Carrie, for getting the ball rolling. Um, before we get to the next question, I'll bring up you know, the one that everybody was wanting to know. Was that my picture on the first slide? Okay, no, that, 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 that's not me. Just trying to provide some humor here as we wait on, we'll wait on questions to come in. So is, uh, one question, is there a cost for participating? Uh, no. There is no cost to GSMA 
for participating in the GSMA Blacklist Exchange. Um, you, there are some requirements that obviously are going to have some type of an internal um, cost and effort, and that is what we are trying to simplify. So that, um, as an example, though, to exchange information, to download information, to upload information, there is there's no cost uh, to participate and to obtain that, that data for blacklisting on your network. Another question. Uh, what is the turnaround time to remove an MEID from the blacklist? Uh, this depends on the – so the question is, to, to, to try to explain a little bit further, someone calls up and they, they report their device lost or stolen. Carrier uploads the device. Device is on the GSMA blacklist globally. It is lost and stolen, marked as lost and stolen. So a recycler, a trader queries the device, you know, next month the consumer goes to the stolenphonechecker.org, enters the device, and shows up that it's, that it's blacklisted. From the time that someone wants to report that device as, lost, as not lost, not stolen, they found it, I was wrong, I'm sorry, it wasn't stolen, it fell between the couch, or something of that nature. Um, if they call into the carrier, it really depends precisely on when they call in and report that, and when that carrier, how frequently that carrier exchanges data with the GSMA blacklist. So if that carrier is still exchanging data on a daily basis at 3 a.m., you know, it depends on when that information is going to be pushed or written to the database that says, nope, I found it, and then the other carriers of when they go exchange information. So within a day or so, that information will be populated through networks. Many carriers, several, I shouldn't say many, but several carriers have already transitioned to hourly exchange of data. And in North America, we have a GSMA has a, a regional interest group where we discuss these type of initiatives, the North American Fraud Forum and Security Group. And we have a best practices guide that helps outline um, how you do these types of things. And that best practices guide um, you know, um, encourages carriers to exchange on an hourly basis. Another question that's come in, what are the next steps to keep RWA membership abreast of getting to participate? Um, I think that uh, we can continue, um, Carrie and uh, Michelle, continue to work together to make sure that you have this information, uh, that we uh, support follow-up direct phone calls. You can email to me directly, uh, but we will want to reach out. You know, if, you have, if you have some level of interest in blocking devices and exchanging and bringing you into the ecosystem of protecting consumers, protecting the ecosystem, uh, making sure that devices that are not with their rightful owner are not in play in the market, on your network, uh, then we want to work with you to help make that happen. And I am responsible for um, some product development initiatives and will want to, would love to have your feedback and to understand what your hurdles are for adoption, if any, so that I can help develop new capabilities again, to simplify and remove uh, barriers to adoption and participation. I think that uh, completes through the list of questions that we have. Uh, another one just came in. Oh, that was the one that was already answered. Uh, any, other, any other questions uh, that you might have, please feel free to uh, Fire away right now. Uh, will I be at Mobile World Congress Americas to discuss? Absolutely. Uh, that will be a, a focal point uh, for GSMA and these initiatives where we will want to drive together uh, adoption. And I would say one of the biggest initiatives uh, that we have that's going to take some time. On the commercial side, we're doing a really good job. Uh, GSMA has been providing the device check service in the U.S. for several years. We have, again, millions of queries per month. 
Um, we are still working on initiatives to ext extend this information to the commercial market for use in making sure that they're not handling lost stolen goods. Um, but we have some room to improve in making sure that law enforcement has access to this information uh, and trying to do that easier maybe than, than perhaps uh, having you know, 10,000 law enforcement agencies all having their own accounts on, in a web environment, knowing that maybe not all of them are going to use an API. So one of the initiatives that we have, it's going to take some time, but leads up to Mobile World Congress Americas, I would say, is working with strategic partners to help push this information out to law enforcement agencies. So, but uh, you may have, uh, you may or may not be aware, but the uh, Mobile World Congress America show has uh, an extensive and growing uh, network and user community in the device repair and recycling um, market. And so, the stolen phone checker uh, portal itself uh, will be represented in some capacity vis-à-vis um, -vis CTIA at the at the show. I hope that uh, answers the question. So any other questions before we come to a conclusion? We will make sure, we'll make sure that you have access to all of this information. Um, Michelle, I know in, in the earlier question was how do we make sure that we uh, have contact? I believe we have the participant's email address, so uh, I'd like to be able to, to reach out to you. Uh, make sure that you have my information make it easy for you to ask questions. You can reach out to me at any time. And we'll give it uh, just a few more seconds for any questions to come in. Michelle, do you have anything before we conclude? Or? I do not. Thank you, Jason. That was very helpful. We appreciate your putting this on. Okay. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. That concludes today's conference and hope to speak with you soon or exchange emails and, and definitely uh, see you in September at the show. This does conclude today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.